Governor Manchin has uh, said in an interview uh, a couple of months ago that he's against cap and trade. He thinks mm -hmm. it's a terrible idea. It's going to kill West Virginia businesses as part of this war on coal mm -hmm. the federal government's waging. Right. What's the difference? If, if, here, if, if cap and trade is the issue, and if cap and trade is really the big threat to right. West Virginia's economy, what's the difference between you and Governor Manchin? Well, I know you're a young man. Uh, I'm old. But there used to be a manager of the New York Yankees named Casey Stengel. When baseball had a situation with the antitrust laws in the 1950s, the United States Senate brought Casey Stengel in front of the United States Senate to talk about the antitrust laws. So Stengel gets up for the United States Congress. And after two hours, and no one could understand what he said, the New York Daily, uh, excuse me, the New York Daily News then said, that there is a terminology for the way Casey speaks, and we'd like to call it Stengalese, because no one can understand it except Casey. And I would revel, or I would compare, Governor Manchin to speaking Stengalese, because if you look at a lot of the things that he says and what he does are two different things. Now, I've seen YouTube, um, YouTube has one out right now with Manchin saying exactly the opposite of what you have to say. Uh, as you know, he's for carbon tax. I don't think he explained how you can be for carbon tax and be against cap and trade. I don't understand that, but he is for carbon tax. And in the state of West Virginia, one of his key pieces of legislation as governor in the summer of 2009 is what is called the West Virginia Renewable Energy Act. And what is the West Virginia Renewable Energy Act? Well, it's West Virginia's version of cap and trade, mansion style. Now, what Joe has done is that he has legislated a bill to impress the Obama administration because Joe is a governor from one of the 11 coal-producing states. So, in, under the West Virginia uh, Renewable Energy Act, in just 15 short years, all of our power plants that generate power in West Virginia uh, will have to start burning something else besides coal 25% worth. In other words, 25% of the fuel, or 25% of the, 25% uh, of, uh, of the 100% of coal that are going into our coal, fire plant, coal power plants will have to be alternative energy. So that is a reduction of 25% of the volume of coal in West Virginia that will be going into these power plants. Now in the bill it doesn't describe what the renewable energy will be. Will it be pretzels, windmills, banana wackies? We don't know yet what it's going to be because it's not described as yet is what it's going to be. But we do know that it will be 25% less coal going into those power plants. Uh, what also is unique about the bill is that West Virginia is abundant with natural resources. He limits, in the bill, he limits natural gas as being one of the um, um, renewable energies. And you could only have 10% natural gas going into the reduction of the 25%. So West Virginia is going to be steering all the hospitals, all the schools, all the universities, all the colleges, about 1,000 of them. Their costs are going to rise. And according to the, uh, uh, excuse me, the uh, Charleston Daily Mail, the average West Virginian's electric bill is going to go up anywhere from 5 to 10 percent. They haven't figured it out yet exactly how far up it's going to go. So here in West Virginia, we have cap and trade. And only it, it, it parallels cap and trade, and that's certainly uh, something that is amazing that a governor would do that. But the trade part is also very interesting too, because each power plant that that uh, generates alternative methods of generating a megawatt, you get a credit, and that credit is issued by the Public Service Commission. So that's the trade part. So he's reduced the usage of all of our power plants by 25% coal. He has no idea what the renewable energy is. He limits the renewable energy and, uh, and only lets natural gas come into 10%. And he has the Public Service Commission illustrate and extend credits to the power company for the, ma uh, for the manufacture of each megawatt. So if that isn't cap and trade, I don't know what it would be. He's already instituted it. It's law in West Virginia. Um, I think here in Pennsylvania it might be an idea, since we have Governor Rendell up here, might check on Pennsylvania because if they did it in West Virginia, uh, who knows what Governor Rendell might have done. Uh, something else you had said a minute ago, describing cap and trade is basically a nationalization, in a sense, of 19% of the U.S. economy. Yes. How? It's control of industry. It's, the, it's not an environmental issue. 
is it is it controlled in a different manner than is already exercised through through taxes? Absolutely. It's a control of the CO2 emissions in this country. Uh, let's take a look. Is, is there some myths? Uh, is CO2, first of all, is it a toxic or a dangerous health situation? We have seen no scientific evidence where it is. The largest polluter in the world today are oceans. Oceans today emit 185 billion tons of CO2 through evaporation. If you take the entire amount accumulated and manufactured by man, you have six billion tons of CO2. Uh, if you take one volcano that would go off anywhere in the world today, it has more dangerous toxins in one volcano than man can produce in the entire arena of the world. So is it an issue or is it control? And when you look at control, and it's sort of an interesting scenario, when you look at the cap and trade, it gives us an opportunity to, 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 to the government to control the emissions, but also control the output and the productivity of our operations in this country. And if you believe in capitalism, as I do, productivity is what makes capitalism move. And the cornerstones of capitalism are energy and private property. So when you have a bill so ominous as this bill that controls your energy and controls the private property and the usage, coupled with things like EPA, you have government basically controlling your entire energy and controlling industry in general. If you look at the dangerous toxin gas emission codicil in the uh, air pollution control bill that's already law in this country, that the fact that Ms. Jackson or Ms. Brown can institute, if they consider CO2 a dangerous toxin, they can already institute as a dangerous toxin, cap and trade, or a control over that CO2. Now, what makes that uh, specifically alarming and going back into controlling industry is the fact that if this is done and CO2 is then considered a dangerous toxin or a dangerous gas, then in, in permit work across this country, under cap and trade, it'd be 25,000. 25,000 tons of CO2 put into our air by production, you'd have to get a permit. If this goes into effect, then it's only 250 tons. So you've taken permits from 14,000 permits in industry across the United States to 6.1 million permits. Once again, how many new regulators do we have to hire? How big is government going to get? And when you start looking into this bill and the manifestation of the size of government and where it's leading to, it's once again a total increase in, in the cost of operation, in people's private lives, in your, in, and certainly in, in a competitive nature in this country, of what we have to compete with. It is an ominous bill that is just absolutely something that our country can't take now or ever. Did I answer that question? <laughs> I'm out of breath. <laughs> I got going too far.